As a sommelier, you're expected to do every position in the restaurant. Hey guys, I'm here with Lindsay Young. She's the head sommelier at Selvis, a Michelin star restaurant in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It's great to be with you, Lindsay. Thanks for having me here. It's great to have you. Great. We're going to chat about, you know, just the business of sommelier, what you do. I'm very, very interested in knowing, you know, how your day looks like. And the whole idea about this series is to give uh, other sommeliers practical insights on what they can do to apply, you know, how you tackle problems, especially. Okay. And how you dry wine cells and all that. So we'll go into that. Why don't you introduce yourself, you know, to the audience and just uh, give us a walk through your journey, please. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Lindsay Young. I'm the lead sommelier here at Sobeys Restaurant uh, down in Atherton. I've um, been a sommelier for about 10 years now, um, making my journey through the Court of Master Sommeliers. So uh, before I was at Selby's. I was at our sister restaurant, Spruce, over in San Francisco. And uh, before that, at Park Tavern for a number of years. And Alexander Steakhouse was my first sommelier job in the city. So I got my certified sommelier in 2013 and then um, studied and passed the advance in 2017. And I'm now uh, working on uh, accomplishing the master sommelier goal. Hi guys, so this is Selby's. I'm just gonna give you a little uh, look inside the restaurant, kind of show you what I do on my daily basis. Let's go. So this is our bar and lounge area that's first come, first serve. We don't accept reservations in here and we do have an a la carte menu available, as well as the prefix menu that is available in the dining room. Uh, so typically, when I come into work, the first thing I do is I look for wine deliveries um, because it's Tuesday. Um, I typically do my ordering today, so we don't have many deliveries, but we do have one. So today we got uh, the Rene Rostang Cote Roti, uh, La Landon bottlings, 2011 and 2016 vintage. So. Typically what I would do is um, go ahead and unpack the swine, uh, set it, station it up on the bar, and then go ahead and process this, inv this invoice into inventory. Um, and then I would print the barcodes and stickers for the wine and then properly stock it in our cellar. Nice, and how long have you been doing uh, sommelier as a career? Um, Almost 10 years now. Fantastic. Yes. Why, why chose this direction? What inspired you? Yeah, well, um, I fell in love with the restaurant industry mm -hmm. when I started uh, working in it, which was in around 2008. Um, and the small restaurant I worked at, there was a, a the gentleman who owned it was from Spain and mm -hmm. he taught me a little bit about wine. And I remember him explaining mm -hmm. um, the Priorat region and how um, the soil type and the aspect of the slope and the proximity mm -hmm. to the ocean and all these um, all these things came into play to create what was in my glass that mm -hmm. I was drinking and it just um, completely fascinated me mm -hmm. and it made me want to learn more and um, as I decided to make restaurants a serious career mm -hmm. I knew that that was the angle I wanted to take nice. and it's an extremely rewarding profession because yeah uh, there's so much to learn it's endless yeah so um, the more I learn the more I want to know great great I think uh, you you are in a Michelin star restaurant one of the questions I'm personally all this interested in is is there something different uh, for the wine some tasks which are done differently a little bit compared to a non you know fine super fine uh, restaurant where you're expected to have that skill you know just in this kind of setup Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a higher level of formality mm -hmm. here with all aspects of wine service. Um, you know, we 
have quite a large selection of wines. So we have wine cellars to keep our whites and our reds mm -hmm. and champagnes mm -hmm. at the proper temperatures mm -hmm. for serving. Um, we pour all of our wines by the glass table side. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, go through the formalities of decanting wines mm -hmm. and presenting older wines in a cradle as to not disturb the sediment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's just a higher level of expectation to be able to educate the guest and speak to them mm -hmm. about the different producers and styles and vintages mm -hmm. on the wine list. So any new first time, you know, uh, person trying to apply for a sommelier job, usually it's hard to get because obviously you, you have you know, you need to be experienced enough in a lot of other things. So normally, yeah. do you think that you would ask at least that you have you worked at other restaurants as a sommelier is, is the main thing? Otherwise, you would just not have that person if they've never worked in a restaurant. Yes, uh, we've um, I've been approached before about you know, you know someone who's aspiring to be a yes. sommelier, but has only been on the retail side of things, for instance, mm -hmm. or um, just has a strong passion for mm -hmm. wine and um, Really, it's it's about the personality of the person. But you so do hire without... Uh, I would consider it. Okay. And if they have the right personality and have the right drive, then it would be a matter of just trying to encourage them to come into the restaurant Got and, it. you know, start at a position such as a host Got and it. work or a food runner, work your way up to a captain and, mm. you know, let them know that... Um, you know, my job as the lead sommelier is to support the mm. staff who is interested in learning more about wine and encourage them to do so and help further their path towards being a sommelier if that's what they want to do. So, um, you know, we wouldn't hire someone just as a sommelier if yeah. they haven't worked as a sommelier in a restaurant before. Yeah, but there's always a place they can start as exactly, well, right? Exactly, oh, yeah. yeah. So well, it's about really just getting good people in what the kind of team dynamics are there you know you said host and then captain and then da 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 so uh, what kind of you know uh who all you know work here yeah so um starting at the door we mm -hmm. have uh, a mater d mm -hmm. um accompanied by a couple of hosts mm -hmm. um we have bartenders okay and bar backs okay uh, we have captains. Okay, what is a captain? So a captain is the front server, the lead server, the person who... Who goes and takes the order? Who, yeah. Explains the menu, takes the order, is really in in control of um, pacing uh, the tables and taking um, care of the guests. So you would have multiple captains? We have multiple captains and then... And then we, you divide the restaurant? How, how do you structure that? So we have this uh, main dining room here and then just above us is our balcony mm -hmm. level. And so they each have 11 tables. So we'll have two captains on uh, each level. Okay. And then we have uh, back waiters who assist the captain. So they um, do everything from marking glassware for wine service to marking uh, the proper silverware for the next course, helping to bust the tables okay. and so forth. Got it. Uh so captain is a person who keeps the menu on the table or goes to collect uh, ask for a order or have you decided yet or so the so the dish? host will present the menus and the captains will come over and they will kind of guide them through uh, okay. the experience that they're about to have we do work with a prefix menu mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, a matter of kind of letting them know the style of service and what they're going to expect and then helping them make the correct choices and then um, you know, we have a number of supplemental options that uh, can up the guest check. And so Understood. they're kind of in charge of upselling. Got it. And how does sommelier role fall into this? Um, so the sommelier, so as a sommelier, you're expected to do every position in the restaurant, first of all. Okay. So um, I don't just sell wine. I, you know, I'll take tables if I need to take tables. I yep. run food. Um, seat guests, mm -hmm. help make drinks behind the bar, really whatever has to happen. But my main primary, primary role is to assist guests with uh, beverage selections. Mm -hmm. So when, um, when do you go there? Like, you know, if they have a question only then you go there or you normally 
I approach any table that has a wine list open and okay. I introduce myself and let them know my name's Lindsay, I'm the sommelier here mm -hmm. and I just wanted to stop by and say hello, mm -hmm. introduce myself and let you know that I'm here if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll typically, sometimes they want to talk what, right away. What kind away. of questions they have, you know, let's yeah. walk over a couple of scenarios like, yeah. oh, I'm still thinking or what, you know, oh my, I, I'm sure they don't see the board budget in here, Yeah. but maybe I'm feeling like you know, old world today. How, what kind of questions do they ask? I get all sorts of questions. Some people, the list can be intimidating to some people. So, um, you know, sometimes it's just, we want a red wine. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, then what do you, what's your next yes. answer to that? So from there, it's just a matter of asking, finding out what they really like to okay. drink is how I usually like to start the conversation. Um, to kind of narrow it down in order to be able to... Would you mind walking me over and what questions do you ask to narrow it down? Sure, absolutely. So if I get something as vague as we're looking for a red wine, I'll say, what do you typically like to drink? Mm -hmm. And from there, um, I can generally get a sense of if they like something that's uh, more fruit forward, mm -hmm. um, kind of new world style, so California wines, mm -hmm. or if they tend to like something that's more earth driven, mm -hmm. Um, in which I might start recommending some French or Italian wines. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I try and ask them if they're looking for something more light-bodied or more full-bodied. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, it's often a discussion of what they're gonna be enjoying with their meal mm -hmm. and trying to pa pair something based on the preferences that they've told me about. And then Do you end up just giving one option? I mean, if I was, let's say perf if i was in that position i would normally do like um you know john here's uh, this cab at mm -hmm. and here's another cab which i would recommend one mm -hmm. would be let's say 40 dollars a bottle and one maybe 120. Exactly. so then at least they're comfortable in select how would you approach exactly you so it's about giving them multiple options not trying to pigeonhole them into something really expensive you yes. want to gain their trust yeah and it's about just providing the best experience you mm -hmm. can have not about selling them the most expensive bottle so um i typically will give probably three different suggestions mm, because you want to give them some options but you don't want to overwhelm them understood um and so typically i try and recommend three different wines at varying price points and be able to talk about slightly different nuances in the flavor profile. What happens exactly wines. after, let's say, okay, well, Lindsay, we'll go with this. And then exactly walk me over what happens. You go back and then, you know. Sure, yeah, so at that point, um, I'll confirm the wine with them, mm -hmm. ask them if I can remove the wine list, and then okay. I will go to the cellar and okay. retrieve the bottle and present it to the guest. Mm -hmm. And once I've presented it, um, we have these wine stations both here and upstairs on our balcony floor. And uh, as a sommelier, I open the bottle um, and decant it depending on mm -hmm. whether or not it needs to be decanted, yeah. but always taste it to proof it to make sure that mm -hmm. it's sound because we don't want to serve our guests something that's mm -hmm. not in proper condition. Um, and once I've proofed it, then um, Someone at that point should have marked the table with the proper glassware for the wine. How does that happen? So it, typically it's the, uh, I will let the captain of so the table know. So you punch in a system or you manually will say so, behind the scene? Um, I will typically verbal to the captain okay. what wine has been ordered or just what glassware Got it. I need. Um, and either they will mark the proper glassware or they will ask the back waiter to do so. So before you, are picking uh, someone else will come here because the moment you went and you just told them that this is a glassware I need for example. Yeah okay. so typically by the time I get back to the table the glassware should be ready to go right. when I present it. So right. after I proof it I return pour the guest a taste of wine mm -hmm. um, you know walk Understood. around clockwise and so and till uh, from that selection process to pouring you handle the process. Correct. You pour them right? Yes. Got it. And then the bottle is kept here, you said, uh, just to... It depends on how crowded the table is. Sometimes I'll leave the bottle on the table because guests do like to... Oh, I thought it was uh, for the glass pours, but if it's bottle... Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, understood. Yeah, for the bottle, yeah, then I leave it on the table. And then at what time do you, you know, sense that this is getting empty or... Or at, what do you do, like, to the guests? How is it, you know, do you, you know, you, you would go there in five minutes and ask them you know are you liking it are you enjoying 
Not typically. That's typically Orange. what happens when you proof the wine. You pour okay. them a taste Got and it. they either accept it yeah. or deny it. Understood. Um, and then just maintain, you know, proper level in the glassware as the meal goes on. And uh, if when a bottle does mm -hmm. start to get low, you typically want to um, offer to... And they do the refill themselves? No, 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 okay. no, no. So if you see that it's done, yeah. someone will come and yes. pour, yeah. and it's not you, someone else will. I typically, I try and do it as much as I can, okay. but on um, you know, the captains are supposed to be on top of it as well. So what, either myself or the captain will make sure that the guest does not ever have to touch the bottle. Mm -hmm. And on a night, you know, you guys are facing low sales, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and do you even look at the numbers while the night is on and just try to, if it's just like literally there is no wine out there, maybe mm -hmm. you, on, on behind the scene, you guys are saying, you know, let, let's try and do something. Uh, do you do that kind of stuff or you monitor yeah. sales? I mean, I, ha I have a sense in my head since I open okay. most of the bottles, um, what sales are every day that the following day, I look at what was sold the night before and process the sales and all the bottles that were sold. Um, throughout the night, I mean, it's always the goal to try and get someone to buy a more expensive bottle. We use language when we're selling wines. How when do you we're do that? Any, any tips? Yeah, so, you know, when you're recommending three different wines on the wine list and pointing out and you, um, you know, Typically, I'll start with yeah, the most with value this. friendly one and kind of point that out. Um, and then, and you, you know, you maybe just lightly recommend that, but Understood. then you, t when you point to the more expensive yeah. bottle, that's when you start using a lot of descriptive language. Mm. And um, you go deeper into explanation and storytelling yeah, of that. Exactly. Uh, you yeah. you've build the trust with the value. Hey, right. this is there. Exactly. Let them know that but that's an option. But let me option. tell you about this. Exactly. You know? And, you know, using vocabulary yeah. such as like lush, hedonistic, decadent. Mm. You know, there's just certain words that um, help kind of paint a picture mm -hmm. and help describe what, what, what the experience will be like. What's your favorite cell you remember? Like, like just like, bam, you know, you feel good about it. <laughs> Anything that comes to mind? Um, my most recent favorite cell was the Clos Rougeard Blanc. Uh -huh. So it's a, a Chenin Blanc made by... Um, and that happened because you thought that you did something? Yes. Okay, what, what did you do there? Well, I believe I just told them with such conviction what an incredible wine it is. It's really rare to find on wine lists and it fit the bill to kind of what they were looking for. Um, as an alternative to like a white burgundy, something with a bit more body, but still mm -hmm. earthy and really bright. Um, and they loved it. Let's go on the menu planning. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, signs do you use or the process do you use to come and design a winning menu, right? What are the elements? What are the goals for a menu? Profit, mm -hmm. sales, you know, maybe I just know that mm -hmm. maybe there are more like matching the restaurant theme mm -hmm. you know walk me over the objectives that a menu has to meet sure um so i think it starts with a concept okay. and it depends on the restaurant what your concept's going to be um here at selby's also at spruce and village pub our other michelin star restaurants we are um, pretty heavily focused on um old, yep, old world wines um uh, classic regions, classic producers from okay. uh, heavy on Burgundy, heavy on Bordeaux, uh, quite a nice selection of Italian wines from Tuscany okay. and uh, Piemonte. Um, but we also do support and represent. And why did you California come to wines. that conclusion? Like, how, why is that what you have? Like, is that because of some food cuisines? I think that the old world wines, French and Italian wines specifically, tend to be the best wines to enjoy with food just mm -hmm. because they show a bit of restraint as far as the alcohol and the fruit content. Mm -hmm. um, they have really nice acidity mm -hmm. and the sort of earth umami presence really okay. allows them to pair really nicely with food. Once you get in, California wines are great. Um, and we uh, have a great selection of California wines and it's you know the preference for a lot of people. Um, but I'm just of the opinion that wines that are really 
heavily fruity and oaky and high in alcohol can tend to kind of overpower a lot of the nuances in food. Understood. How have you like, you know, positioned the menu, let's say page one, page two, and you know, in the beginning, maybe there must be a reason, like do you start with low to high or? So we start, um, I would say, kind of with lighter bodied, moving to more full bodied, okay. as far as like the, the structure, the and layout of, just the, of the menu. Um, within the white and the red wines, we start, we represent uh, the new world okay. before the old world. Um, and then within those categories, we are structured from north to south. Got it. And does the system, what software do you use, uh, monitors like exactly the sales and the profit contribution for, for that SKU? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we use an inventory system called Binwise. Mm -hmm. So um, every time a wine delivery comes, there's an invoice attached with it. So that gets uploaded uh, into Binwise. And um, in addition to that, a purchase log it gets recorded in and then uh, we also make photocopies of it for a hard copy binder here and then we send a copy off to our accountants so that's kind of the process that you go through but with binwise once you upload each uh, SKU, mm. then you print barcodes for it so then we actually physically have to put a sticker on the top of each bottle okay and, and every time it's depleted and you... so the, it gets um when it's connected to our POS system. And so when we ring in a wine, it communicates with Binwise and Understood. shows the proper depletions. And that allows you to also see the inventory left and things like that, Exactly, right? yeah. So we should have, that, which is part of the reason why I have to process the sales every day. Mm. Um, so em empty bottles, maybe you keep it in the side and then at the end you do that? Is that what you mean by process sales? Oh, no, no, no. Just the day afterwards. So because the POS system and Binwise, our inventory system, communicate, I have to actually physically go through and scroll through everything that was sold mm. and confirm and match it, make sure it matches to the correct bottle Understood. in order for the depletions to be correctly recorded. So Beautiful, huh? This is our I'll, I'll hold that. red wine cellar right here. So as you can see, there's a lot of empty space. So this was all filled up uh, pre-pandemic. But and can I just see the yeah. barcode? Is that that's what you? Yes, meant? this is the barcode. So oh, here. Okay. yeah, when I process the wine into Binwise. Uh, so when you take it out, you scan it. No, I only scan it for inventory. I just ring it into inventory the POS received. system okay. and the POS system is in communication with Binwise, which is the Understood. software program. So um, when I match the sales every day, um, I go into Binwise and it basically has recorded everything that was entered in the POS system the night before. And I just match that sale to the appropriate bottling in Binwise and therefore it shows our accurate depletions. So when you take this to the guest, mm -hmm. this doesn't look bad? So we t I take it off before I present it to the guest. Understood. Yes. So typically I will immediately ring in the bottle, then I come and retrieve the bottle, take off the sticker, put it on mm. uh, the receipt, mm. um, and that just shows that the bottle um, has An been empty bottle goes straight away in the recycling? Just to the recycling, yeah. Gotcha. So this is our other, this is our white wine cellar. <clears throat> I've never seen different white and because of the temperature. So yes, okay. yeah, we keep them at different temperatures. Um, this room at about 56 degrees mm -hmm. um, and the red room at about 59 degrees. So I'm just gonna go here more. Yeah. I wanted, I'm interested to know uh, any particular elements go in the design aspect of this? Like, do you need to have, you know, some spaces for champagnes and some, you know? We do. So this whole rack right here is for half bottles. Well, starting from here up okay. and then from here down is uh, for magnums. And then you have box space as well. And then we have box space. And then these cubbies are for wines that move um, Fast. more quickly. Mm -hmm. So these are by cases. Exactly. By, these are the case products. Exactly. Bottle sales. And then, yeah, the wines on the wall tend to be higher in wines that don't move as quickly. 
um, and are more intended for cellaring. So these rooms were completely full before COVID, but we sold off a lot of wine during quarantine. So it is now the task to uh, build it back up over the next few months as to what it was before. Got it. What are the challenges, you know, for this role? You know, that, that you find it, okay, I think pay attention here and this is how you can solve this. One of the examples I, I can think of is inventory management maybe. You know, it, what are the pain points of this task, you know, let's say? Um, inventory is a lot of work, okay. for sure. Um, it's tedious. Um, I, what I, can go wrong there? What can go wrong? Missing bottles, TV? Yes, so, yes, so missing bottles. So for instance, you know, I, I did inventory yesterday um, and it's not just a matter of scanning and counting all the bottles. Once you do that, you print out a report and typically there's some sort of variance report. So mm. uh, a variance report means the difference in what the computer says you should have in-house compared to what I actually counted in-house. So then it's a matter of going through and recounting mm. anything that had a variance mm. to make sure that my count was correct and then identifying you know where the holes are coming from so mm. we um we do we have a lot of staff who purchase wine at cost so mm. that can be taken into consideration okay. we um do transfers from property to property we do uh, retail bottle sales oh, so people can buy and go yes okay. yeah. so there's um just a lot of different moving parts Understood. i suppose that at the end you kind of just have to separate out yeah and um it, it's it's a very tedious organization which is your top selling SKU. I uh, just want to know uh, the, the number of units, let's say, do you move any product you have, which you do five cases a week of just one product? No. We what, do, what's the top one? No. Um, I think our top selling wine right now is the Biocart Salmon Brut Rosé Champagne that mm -hmm. we pour by the glass. How much you sell? Um, we probably go through two cases a week a of week. that. So that's your upper limit, for example. Yeah. Uh, what is an average? Uh, how do you gauge that this product is a dog product or I think I'm done with this? You know, wh what's the radar like? So you're I mean, not going to just keep having something which has never moved, for which two has months, never right? moved. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do want to um, have a large wine list here, so we're not exactly trying to move product off the menu. We're more right now trying to build it out because we started very modest. We just opened on September 7th. Oh. So we started. Yeah, you don't have trends. With a yet. Yeah, we but started. From with your previous experience, let's say, okay. you know, uh, how do you uh, say that, okay, when do you decide <laughs> I'm done with this wine? Yeah. At what point? So in the past, wine lists I've had were a bit smaller and I wanted to have a dynamic wine list. So mm -hmm. I wanted it to be constantly changing because the size was smaller. And so I wanted it to always be interesting. So I would, at my last restaurant, for instance, I would just order, you know, however many cases to get best price. Maybe it was two, maybe it was three. And once I moved through that, I would just move on to something else. Okay. Um, and then there's other restaurants that I've worked at where, you know, an, especially white wine because it has a little bit less of a shelf life yeah. you know say you order a case of it and it takes a long time to move then you just you know realize that you're probably gonna try and pick a different wine that might be more appealing mm -hmm. is there any particular way you run you know your uh your gig where you think you know you have that special skill you're adding value uh, which other sommeliers don't have. You've acquired the knowledge, experience that I think that particular thing you know by the gut and experience, you know, that I think this will move. Well, I've been doing this for 10 years, so it's, yes, I tend to have a pretty good sense of what does move. Mm -hmm. um, like just looking at the concept, you would know what yes, kind of customers I, will yes, come and so instance, on. For instance, we do have um, a lot of meat on our menu. We have a, a number of different steaks on the menu so mm. it's steaks uh, okay yes yeah, so it's pretty obvious to me that we're going to sell through a lot of california cabernet yeah. and we're going to sell through a lot of bordeaux understood so those are areas it comes by experience as yeah, well i guess the, yeah um, and just knowing what you 
you know, what your food menu is and, yeah. you know, what wine is going to pair with that. So, uh, you know, this is just mainly for the sommeliers who are uh, given a task of preparing a menu of a new restaurant. You know, you've just done that. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a good, good uh, segue. Uh, what questions would you ask a business owner? Uh, let's say, what are you trying to achieve and those kind of things and then present him or her this mm -hmm. concept. This is what your thoughts are. You know, are there any particular set of things that you would want to know as a you know consultant, let's say, or a sommelier or a wine director, you know, whichever approach, whoever is doing this task mm -hmm. for that particular restaurant? Yes, I mean, I think it's just important to have a clear vision of what the concept is okay. for, you know, the owner um, and really just having an understanding of what the cuisine is going to be like. Okay. Um, what about budget? How much money is oh, the person? Oh, absolutely. That's okay. very important. Yeah. So let's so, say, I, Lindsay, I can only do 10,000 worth of inventory. So that's that. Then there right. is concept. Then right. there is cuisine. Then? Then there's cuisine. The cost of menu is there or like how expensive are we going to print? Yes. Um, that's that's definitely a concern the cost of the menu i mean are you going to go digital are you going to do it on paper is it going to be uh, do you want to have a book with a lot of selections or is it just going to be printed on the back of the menu is book number of pages related to the people working do you think that has any relation you know if you just had one person running around maybe it's just better to put five wines i don't know i'm just thinking loud here oh do you mean in relation to the number of sommeliers on the floor yeah Absolutely. When so menu you, pages. Yeah, when you have a, a, a book of wine, um, I think at that point you tend to want a sommelier or someone to be able to come mm -hmm. um, help the guests make the selection. When uh, you have a wine list that's a hundred pages, yeah. a person could just be stuck a in the book. A lot of people may have questions, right? Simultaneously. Yes, yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have a, a team of sommeliers here. Let, let, let's say what kind of things you look for when you buy a new wine, right? Um, look for value, okay. the quality of the wine. Um, typically, um, you know, that's one of our main jobs as a sommelier, right, is to be able to taste wine and know if it is correctly representative mm -hmm. of that style. Mm -hmm. So if it's a Russian River Valley Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. is it, you know, juicy and fruity mm -hmm. and, um, you know, maybe some notes of oh. So basically, so typicity forth. is the main thing that you pay more attention to. Exactly. That does it belong typicity to where it and, should be? And value. And yeah. value. Typicity and value. Um, you know, always looking. What about you know, support? Do you ask uh, them things like, I may have to reprint the whole menu. Would you take care of the cost or like, or do a promotion or what do you do there? Absolutely. There's, uh, we have relationships with uh, certain distributors. Okay. And so, um, in many uh, restaurants I've worked at in the past, if you do a certain case commitment, for instance, mm -hmm. they'll um, help uh, cover the cost of new menus. Mm -hmm. um, we have a program here with the, the Bacchus Management Group where our sommeliers get sent on uh, international trips every year. Mm -hmm. So they get to go on a wine trip. Um, and so doing a certain amount of business with a distributor mm -hmm. um, earns us those, those educational experiences. Understood. Cool. And uh, promotion wise, you know, what sort of promotions work best? Uh, you know, you said one is this trip annual quota, let's say, but ongoing, if there is something not moving, what can suppliers do to help you immediately? Let's say, you know, next 10 days, if they can just do something. Um, sometimes they can offer um, additional support through like sample bottles to mm -hmm. help bring down our costs mm -hmm. um, so that we can sell the wine at actually a lower price mm -hmm. and help move it. Um, it's about the only thing I can do you, think of. It. Do you not like, uh, I guess this is a fine res uh, establishment, but would you just create a wine by glass program if there was a need to just if there's a lot of something. inventory of something yeah. stuck, you know? Yes. In, in the past with restaurants, that's definitely what I've done in order to move something, okay. um, you know, put it on by the glass and that'll help move through things. Here, we're a, a bit more regimented with what we pour by the glass because we have commitments with certain distributors. And so um, we're kind of expected 
to keep the certain yeah. lines on the list. Understood, yes. Yeah. So it's more of a relation you want to continue. Maybe one final question uh, okay. that came to my mind. Define a good sommelier, you know, uh, to you, like who's you would hire. Okay. Like really hire, like, you know, you pay 20% yeah. more and hire a sure. good sommelier. <laughs> it's about a genuine sense of hospitality and right. warmth. Um, being humble. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pretension in this industry and specifically on the sommelier side of things. Um, and I think just really being able to to relate on a personal human level and mm -hmm. really try and curate the best possible guest experience mm -hmm. is what it's about. It's, it's about organization and it's about knowledge, um, but it's it's really about humility mm -hmm. and and an authentic desire to create the best possible guest experience. So you think that's where most of them fail because they don't have that empathy, humble nature or, or the appetite to serve. That's where you see most like go can't do that. Yes.